this message that I'm going to give to you quickly is very difficult for me. Because I know far more about pride than I do humility. In Matthew 21, verse 5, there are five words that I want to use as the start off of this night. It says this. <clears throat> Behold, thy king cometh meek. I want you to say this. Behold, Behold. thy king cometh meek. It did not say, Behold, thy king cometh powerful. It didn't say, Behold, thy king cometh wise. It didn't say, Behold, thy king cometh levitating. There's a reason why it says this. Was he wise? He is wisdom. Was he powerful? He is all power. But he comes a specific way. Behold, thy king cometh meek. Meekness marks the arrival of Jesus. <laughs> In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, the scripture says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am humble. For I am humble. The one time that Jesus ever describes his own character from his own mouth, he chooses one word. And he chooses this word, humble. So if there's one thing that Jesus wants you to understand about what and who he is, he chooses this word, humble. He could have chosen so many, any other thing that he wanted to describe himself, but he chose this one. Because he knew you and he knew me and he knew that in the midst of his greatness and his majesty, we would separate him, try to separate him from his core internal reality, which is humility. Men are attracted to all kinds of God's externals, but when it comes to the internals, which is humility, this is where people start losing interest. But this is what houses the presence of God. Jesus was the tabernacle of God, was he not? So he was God's home, walking around, a living, walking carrier of the glory. And he says, if you're going to be a carrier of the glory, this is what the characteristic is that carries the glory, humility. We would rather him have said, the carriers of the glory are disciplined. The carriers of the glory are strong. No, he says, the carriers of the glory are humble. Do you want to carry the glory of God? I assume that's why you're here. And I believe the Lord has a word for you tonight. And it's this. Choose humility. One may see him as this, another may see him as that. But Jesus forever settles what his character actually is. He says... I am humble. Who else can say such beautiful words? <laughs> Who else can actually say that? No one. No one but you, precious Lamb of God, can say such tender words. See, because of these words, we know what God is looking for from us. Because Romans chapter 8, verse 29, it tells us that God predestined you to be conformed to the image of the Son. Did he not say this? So let me ask you a question. What does God want from you? He wants you to look like Jesus. And what does Jesus look like? He's humble. 
This is what God wants from you. Jesus was sent to bring humility back to the earth, as Andrew Murray said. He's looking for humility. In James chapter 4, verse 6, the scripture shows us that grace is continually flowing into the humble. Like a fountain flowing down out of heaven continuously into those who are humble. And the opposite is true. Those who are not humble, the scripture says, God resists them. In other words, he prohibits their entrance into his presence. As a matter of fact, the word actually has to do with stopping a door with your foot. Have you ever been playing hide and go seek when you were a kid and a kid that you didn't like was trying to get in the room and you blocked him from opening the door? God blocks the entrance into his presence when you are proud. What is pride? Everything that's not humble. It's important, guys, that we see this. Pride is resisted, resisted by God. Pride drains you of grace. It blinds you to his face. It withers men into snakes. It's flight from God's help, the custodian of hell, the fortress of lusts. It threw angels to dust. It's the devil's cusp. It's Lucifer's invention and God's only prevention. We must hate it. We must hate it so deep that we can see with the prophets, if you go through Isaiah chapter 2, verse 17, verse 12, verse 23, Proverbs 16, 5, Daniel 5, 20, you see that what God is coming back to make right when he comes to the earth, he's coming back to bring low the proud. The problem he sees with the earth is this, they're proud. This is his issue with humanity. You think yourself something. And my heart feels like the Lord is trying to say, pride provokes me. P pride is provoking God. It makes man his enemy. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Nothing is so opposed to God as pride. What is pride? Pride is selfishness. Self-sufficiency, self-effort, self-centeredness, self-exaltation, self-consciousness. It's me, me, all about me. Vance Havner said, if God came to save us, he came to save us from I, myself, and me. I'm telling you, the greatest hindrance to everything God wants to do in your life is your eyes fixed on you as Keith Green also said, it's so hard to see when my eyes are on me. We must hate pride, even as the scripture says in Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate pride, arrogance, in every evil way. We must hate pride because you can't fight Satan with Satan. James chapter 4, verse 10 says, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. Do you see that he links two things together again? Humility and the presence. They're connected. God sews them together. It's very important for us to see this. And let me just tell you, there's a difference between, quote, humility and humbling yourself. Let me explain it for you. Humility is Jesus' character. <clears throat> humbling yourself is bringing everything low to his feet. So it's like this. Humble yourselves and the Lord will exalt you. Humbling yourself means I bring everything down to your feet and then God grabs you and exalts you into the humility of Jesus. He doesn't take you out of humility so you don't no, no longer have to be humble. What he does is when you go low, he brings you up into the heights and glory of what humility actually is. It looks like Jesus. Humility is the character and nature of Christ. Humbling yourself is bowing low in honest, in honesty before God, where you're able to lay in front of him your very heart, your motives, your intentions, your expectations, your desires, your own family, your possessions, your calling, 
your gifts, your past, your present, your future. I give it all to you. I lay it all at your feet. And I'm telling you right now, if he sat here physically right now and it was just you and him in this room and he looked at you and he said, we got to have a meeting about your heart. The moment that you make eye contact with him who knows all, you would begin to see all kinds of things on the inside of you. How you dealt with this, how you said that, what was going on with your intentions, your motives, sin that's been hidden, different things down in the, in the bottom. He'd look at you in the eyeballs with love and he'd say, let's talk about your heart. And you know what you would do? If you have any sense, you'd throw everything down at his feet and say, oh, here, here's all of me, broken and empty, and I'm weak, and I have nothing without you. I recognize I have nothing without you. Take my heart, take my whole life too. I give it all to you, Lord. Bowing low to the Spirit of God, he will rush in, And he will fill you just as water seeks to fill the lowest place. When you go low, the Holy Spirit will rush in to fill you. This is the picture of those that are low are the ones that are able to be filled up with the presence of God. Here's the reason why so many people are dry. They're too high. You got to go low. Go low and then you'll find the riches of the presence of God. You know the reason why God raises up people who are bowed down? It's because those that are bowed down have lost any desire to be raised up at all. They left it all at his feet. Sink or swim, Lord, I'm here for you. It's just you. This is our Christ, guys. (laughs) Lowly and meek and humble. He could have always taught standing on the water, but he chose not to. Because he's humble. He has this character about him that he says in Luke chapter 22, verse 7, he goes, I am among you as him who serves. Are you hearing what he just said? God, who created all things, sustains all things by the power of his own words, says, I come to you to serve you. (laughs) There's nothing like this. What's a servant? A servant puts the needs of another above his own. He says, I am among you as him who serves. This is God's disposition, the way that he is. See, people ask me sometimes, how can I tell if I have the same servant heart that Jesus had? Well, I'll tell you one good way. How do you react when someone treats you like a servant? This will tell you whether or not your heart is laid low before God. When someone else is exalted above you, how do you react? If you're already low below them and your desire is to uphold and lift up everybody else, then you can only rejoice for those who are lifted up. You will only feel competition and comparison to the degree that you've placed yourself higher than that person. Go low and you'll find the riches of his presence right there. Matthew 23, verse 11, Jesus tells us if you want to be the greatest, you've got to be the least. Now, what Jesus is saying is not if you choose to go into a humble place, I'll come and lift you out of that humility. If you choose to serve others, then I'll come and make it so that one day you'll be served. That's not what he's saying. He's saying when you really understand who I am, then you'll see that the highest place is the lowest place. Serving others is the highest place. It's not how you get there. It's it. (laughs) It's so important, guys, because this is how you walk in his presence. Everything contrary to humility cannot house the presence. And I'm telling you, I find people all the time, I do these things called the school of his presence. And I want to talk to people about enjoying the bliss and glory of Jesus every day and walking in his presence. But I find people all the time who are like, I don't have that kind of a life. I, I literally stumble upon God here. I stumble upon God there. But I don't live a life of enjoying his presence. I'll tell you the number one reason why. They're too high. God only stays in humble residences. You want to abide in him and him abide in you? 
That's where it's going to take place. I'm amazed at how little humility is talked about, guys. I'm really amazed at it because it's the root of childlikeness. I want you to say this with me. Childlikeness is the absence of self-consciousness. Say it again. Childlikeness is the absence of self-consciousness. When you get that, you'll find the key to the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? All the riches there are in Jesus Christ. All the wonders of his person are accessed through childlikeness because the kingdom's given freely to the children. But when you're self-conscious, you're no longer childlike. This is the one indispensable condition for fellowship with God. is humility. Humbling yourself. To God, the lowly heart is the chief mark of following the lovely Lamb of God. In my earlier days, I sought God and I wanted to elevate or levitate or glow. Or <laughs> <laughs> Lord, make me a glowing saint so people can... I wanted to... People, demons to manifest at the sound of my voice. I wanted to heal people with my shadow. This was my goal. Now, it's so different today. I want the humility of Jesus. Because I see here is where God dwells. How many of you are with me? Yeah. Do, you, you want, do you have a desire for this? Is, is this? is this what you want? <laughs> Last year, my wife asked me, she goes, you can have anything you want for your birthday, what would it be? And this desire for humility rose up in my heart and I, tears came out of my eyes and I said to her, how much is a humble heart? Can you afford that one? No. Because it means you got to go low. No one can give you humility but Jesus. No one can humble you for you. you got to choose to humble yourself. I can't be humble for you. You can't be humble for me. See, Satan breathed pride into Adam and he sprang forth a humanity that had no room for God. Daniel Kalinda told me one time, God will send no one home empty except those that are full of themselves. Andrew Murray said, without humbling ourselves, there can be no true abiding in God's presence or experience of his favor. Did you hear that? I'll read it one more time because I felt like you didn't hear me. Andrew Murray said, humbling ourselves, there can be no true abiding in God's presence without humbling our, sorry, without humbling ourselves, there can be no true abiding in God's presence or experience of his favor. Humility is the key fruit of the presence of God. The holiest of all was the humblest of all. And so this is what we need to have a fresh desire for in our hearts. Humility puts me where I'm supposed to be and it puts God where he's supposed to be. Humbling ourselves alone allows God to do everything for you. Listen closely, you need to get this. Say this, humbling myself, humbling myself. I, allow God I allow God to do everything himself. Which shows you this, to the degree that you don't humble yourself, to, the, that, to that degree, you're still in control. To the degree that you don't humble yourself, you're still operating on a battery power that is really low. You got 3% battery, bro. You're not going to make it. But God is always maxed out. See, humility, Andrew Murray said, humility is the displacement of self and the enthronement of God. Do you want God to rule your life? Humility is how he does this. I go low, Lord. In Jesus, we see humility personified. Jesus is humility personified. And we see in John chapter 5, verse 19, he says, the one who says, I'm humble, he says, I can do nothing on my own. The one who says, I'm humble, 
shows you what humility looks like. I can do nothing on my own. Do you, do you see this kind of humility? You know what else he says in 530? He goes, I do nothing on my own. Not only does he recognize that he can't, he chooses not even to try to do something on his own. This is humility. In, in John chapter 7, verse 16, Jesus says, even the words I'm telling you are not mine. In John chapter 8, verse 28, he continually says again, I, on my own initiative, do nothing. He's completely bankrupt before God. In John 8, 50, Jesus says, I don't seek my own glory. This is humility. Jesus teaches us that the real spiritual life is one of absolute self-renunciation. Jesus is teaching us. What is he teaching us? He's teaching us how to walk with God. And so often we get in the way and we wonder why it's so difficult. People have said this to me before. The Christian life is so hard. Oh, no, it's not. Your yoke that you're wearing is not his. That's why it's heavy. It's not his yoke that's heavy, friend. It's your sin and pride that's heavy. He's easy. His way is easy. This is why men are so restless. They're itching to make themselves holy or to increase in power and gain more gifts. And this is, men are just frenzied like this. This is why they can't get along with their brothers. Prideful people are always looking down on others. And if you're looking down, you cannot see him who is above all. We must keep our hearts before God if we're going to walk in his presence. Man is reluctant to give everything to God because he feels like he's going to lose something and he'll lose control. I'll tell you, here's one of the major issues in our lives. I include myself in here because we're humans. And this is one of our main issues, control. I fear to give this to you, Lord. I don't know what you'll do with it. Nothing is safe that is not committed to him. We fear to commit stuff to him out of fear for the safety of that thing. But I'm telling you, unless it's committed to him, it's in danger. Your very own life, your very own family, the way that you live your life. But if a man relinquishes all to God, then God can be all through man. If you choose not to relinquish, whatever you choose not to relinquish to God, he is unable to pass through that thing. So this is why we have some people completely developed in one area and totally lopsided in another because they let God in here, but not here. And so they're very developed on, on the right-hand side, but their other side is completely, uh, has no strength whatsoever. Now I'm going to get a little bit closer home, okay? And then we're going to close out. But I feel like God has already been speaking to some people today to say freshly to God as he sits in a chair in front of you, eyeball to eyeball, wanting to meet with you about your heart. Some of you are ready to say, Lord, I'm ready. I want to give my entire being fresh to you tonight. Humility is literally Christ's presence through your character. That's all it is. Many people see wonderful, delightful things in the scriptures, okay? Peace that passes all understanding, joy unspeakable, the fellowship of bliss with the Savior. They see these things in the text, in the scriptures, but they feel as if they're unable to actually apprehend them. Maybe you yourself in this room have read the text that says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And you said, well, that's wonderful, and I believe it, but how come it's not real? How come I'm not free? Yeah. Let me tell you something. There's a story of a little boy standing outside of a candy shop. And as he stands outside the candy shop, he's staring at all the wonderful, beautiful candies that he desires so bad and loves them so much. The owner of the shop comes out, sees the boy looking through the window, and he says, hey, son, you like candy? The boy says, yeah. He says, take whatever you want. The boy says, I can't. He says, why not? He goes, because there's a thick plate of glass between me and the candy. I tell you, that thick plate of glass between you and all the promises that God has given to you is pride. You can see the things that God has for you, but you can't grab them. And every time you reach out for it, you're like, 
It's breaking your own fingers, bro. I'm telling you, there's so much God wants to give to you. But first, he's got to take you. You got to let him take you before he can give to you. Only if he's everything can he safely give us anything. This is one of my favorite quotes ever. Andrew Murray said, The insignificances of daily life are the tests of eternity because they prove what spirit really possesses us. What do you mean, Eric? I did, you, there was a lot of big words in there. I don't understand what you really meant. I'm talking about your humility will be seen in your common course of life. Your intercourse with other people. Your hearing one of another and how you respond. This is where you will see if humility is real. Humility is not seen on stage. Humility is not in what someone presents of themselves or says of themselves. Humility is seen in that moment, in your most unguarded moment. That's where humility is really seen. And you know who will see that first? Your wife. <laughs> your husband. <laughs> Leonard Ravenhill said, don't tell me how godly you are. Let me talk to your wife. <laughs> Eric, why are you hidden so close to home? Because I don't know about you. I want to be possessed by God. That's right. I, I, want, I want the real thing. I don't want to just stand up here and say somebody's first, last name, their P.O. box number. Who cares about that if I don't have humility? I don't want to stand up here and rip cast off of people and heal the sick if my heart is distanced from being a resident of God's presence. Who cares? You can go to hell with your gifts. <laughs> Praise God for him. Pursue him. But the reality of it is this. If you don't look like Jesus on the inside, you're not going into the kingdom with him. And this is what it looks like. It looks like humility. See, the soul that can truly say, I have lost myself in finding you. Those, aren't those beautiful words? I have lost myself, Lord, in finding you. This person no longer compares itself with other people. You want to know why? Because they're no longer in the equation. Here's the reason why so many people, maybe people in this room right now, are dealing so deeply with comparison. And it robs you of joy, as you've probably heard that phrase before, comparison is the thief of joy. Some people are miserable because they're constantly comparing what they've got and what they don't have compared to those people that are around them. I'm telling you right now, you have not lost yourself in finding him. But if you lose yourself in finding him, then you'll recognize that in order to compare yourself with other people means you have failed to find everything you need in God. Eric, what in the world does this have to do with growing spiritually? Everything. I, I don't like going to a place and coming back a couple years later and seeing the people are in exactly the same place that they were before. Yeah. And I'll tell you one of the major reasons why people don't progress in their development of the fullness of the image of Jesus in their lives is because they won't go low. I once had a vision. I was praying for people and when I went to this one girl, I put my hand on her head, and I saw a vision. How many of you have ever seen a vision? And in the vision, when I touched this girl, I saw Jesus was trying to put her head on his chest, and she was going like this. She wouldn't let him. He's trying to push her head down to, to rest right here on his breast and gain access to the divine treasure chest. And she wouldn't yield. Do you want to know what that's called? That's called stubbornness. Do you know stiff-necked is stubborn? You know what stubborn means? Stubborn, me stubborn means this. A resolute adherence to your own will. That's pride. It will kill you. I'm, I'm taking off these layers because we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have a meeting about our hearts. We got a meeting about our hearts, guys, tonight. So... Real humility can look upon the feeblest and weakest person in the room and treat them as if they're a son of a king. Real humility, and I read today, C.S. Lewis said this. C.S. Lewis said, 
A humble person doesn't go around, around telling you how terrible he is. Oh, I'm just nothing. He says a humble person will simply just have a real interest in the things that are coming out of your mouth. Are you hearing that? Did you hear that? We're, we are so prideful in our society that while other people are talking, all we're doing is thinking about our rebuttal. You're not even listening to the people. We, we have a hard time just looking at somebody directly in their eyes and giving them full attention. You want to know why? Because it's all about us. You want to know a key to the glory of God being walked out in your life? Be humble enough to listen and receive from everyone around you. It's a key. It's very, very important. Many of us cannot even bear someone being better than us, better treated than us, praised over us. But I'm telling you, we crave to be special. Humanity craves to be special. You'll never get back the time you waste trying to be noticed. It's worthless. His presence will free you from the need to have anything else. Do you know what that means? That means I need nothing. I don't need relevance. I'm not looking for significance. I'm not looking to be somebody who's sectioned off as very important. It doesn't matter because I have you. Sometimes I'm telling you, even in the midst of the most spiritual environments, men can erect a monument to themselves by telling you testimonies of what they've done. This kind of thing makes God really upset. It provokes him. And I'm telling you, God wants to get rid of all of this stuff in us because he wants to reside deep on the inside of us. These same people that are trying to erect a monument in your mind for them by trying to build up a relevance for themselves in your mind by telling you all the wonderful things that they've done, this kind of person is miserable on the inside and has no real connection with God's presence that fulfills them thoroughly. Do they have outward contact with the river? Yeah, but there's no inward drinking. No amount of outward con contact with the river will quench the inward thirst of the soul, period. You can be thirsty and go swimming. You're still thirsty when you get out. We need to drink in the Lord. See, God will smile on one humble man over a million gifted men. This is what's on his mind. Did you know that Jonathan was not selfishly wanting the crown? He was selflessly wanting it to be on the right head. And praise God for such humility. Because now we have the king of kings that came through that line. The son of David. If humility is not the foundation, you better believe it's all come, it will all come tumbling down. I'm making my way through quick. Humility is the vacuum for the grace of God. It's the image of God in man. Pride is anti-God. It's an anti-God mentality. Nothing keeps a man outside of reach of the devil like humility. Staying low. This will be the last thing I get into and then we'll be done, okay? But I really feel I needed to go each one down this line because the Lord is doing something. Each, with each statement, I feel like the Lord is taking another level, another layer off so that you can be completely bare and vulnerable before him so that he can get in there and do that work that he needs to do. See, the prideful man doesn't say, oh, stand back, here I am. <laughs> That's not, he doesn't come into the room like that. You can see his pride by his harshness, his impatience, his longing to control everything, irritations, judgments, comparisons, competitions, jealousies, and bitterness. These are all the fruit of pride. I'm telling you, pride has a tone to it. Pride speaks a certain way. Pride lifts itself above other people. Pride above all is neglect of God. It is sourced in its own strength. See, as I said last night, I don't know anybody who would actually look at God and say, I don't need you no more. <laughs> I'm good. But I'll tell you the number one way you can see if you're prideful, you don't need to spend time with Jesus every day. Spending time with Jesus is just not, I mean, it's cool if I can get it, but it's not really number one priority. I'll tell you this, you're arrogant. Why, why, how can you say that? Because you need him. Yeah. And if you don't come to him, then you think you've got it. You don't come to him to the degree that you feel like you don't need him. To the degree that you know you need him is the degree that you will go to him and run to him where every spare second begins to be a pulling to God. Every lull throughout the day becomes an invitation to come away. 
He's pulling at you. You know that you need him. I remember Dan Kalinda told me one time, a lady had written me a letter t- telling me about how I, she was rebuking me for telling people they need to spend time with God. She's like, I'm a mother of four kids. I, got a, I don't have much time. There's no way I could possibly spend, you know, 45 minutes to an hour with God every day. There's no way I could do it. And then she goes through and she's quoting these real good scriptures. And she's got incredible pullings from old saints from the past. And she put together this incredible little booklet. I felt complete, re, completely rebuked. And I was almost beginning to believe her. And then it dawned on me. This letter is so good, it probably took her three hours to put together. So she's got three hours to talk to me, but not 45 minutes for Jesus. There's something wrong. Dan Kalinda said to me one day, he goes, bro, if I told you, he said this uh, when I told him about the story with the, the mother, he goes, if you went to her and you told her, I'll give you $2 million if you spend an hour with God every day. Do you think she would do it? Absolutely. You want to know why? Because she values the $2 million. You can tell if you value God or not by whether or not you'll make time to be with Him. And money was more valuable to her than the presence of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm not trying to slight nobody. I want to open it up so Jesus can come in. Okay? With tenderness and sweetness. See, there is no pride so dangerous. There is no pride so subtle. There is nothing so insidious as spiritual pride. It slips in unconsciously. It creeps in undetected. You want to know what that pride is? That pride that feels satisfied with its own attainments. That pride that is okay with not giving itself completely over to Jesus because it has everything that it it wants outside of him. What would that even look like? It looks like this. You're finished ministering to somebody or you just left work, and you are so on a high about what God just used you to do, you feel like, I did my service to you, now let me have some me time. Do you know what I'm saying? So that God is not, no, he's no longer source for life, he becomes somebody you're serving, if you will. He's my boss, he's my manager, he's not my bread. God doesn't want to be your boss, he wants to be your bread. So, this is the last thing I'll say. I had a couple more things, but I'm going to close out right here. When my kids fight, and they insist upon their own way, I say to them, hey, 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 which one of you wants to be favored by God? (laughs) Oh, me, 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 me. Now they're both ready to give up their wills. But before... When they didn't have that switch in their mind, they were trying to insist on their own way. I remember I was in the grocery store one time and they they both wanted to hold the phone and my older one ripped the phone away from my younger one. My younger one was trying to get it back and I I saw what was going on and I was just like, whoa, 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 guys, what's going on? And my oldest says like this, she goes, she took the phone from me and I wanna have the phone. The younger one goes, I wanna have the phone. Do you see there's two wills, selfishness each way. You know what I did? I grabbed my oldest one and I whispered in her ear with as much love as I could find in my heart. I said, baby, they spit in Jesus' face. She looks at me and goes, daddy, what in the world are you talking about right now? I said, baby, they spit on him. She goes, what does that have to do with anything that's going on in public right now? I, I, don't, I don't understand. I said, no, he, I'm telling you, they spit on his face. They actually spit on his face and he loved them. And she goes, that's Jesus, daddy. It's not me. He's, he's God. He's perfect. I'm not. And then I said, that's exactly my point. He will be just as perfect as he was in humanity as a human through your humanity if you'll yield to the Holy Spirit. He can be himself through you. So I was trying to show her that if you will yield to God in the midst of pain, of not having your own way, the inward bleeding of having to renounce yourself, the Holy Ghost will come in and Christ will be shining through your face. 
It's the secret. Oh, Eric, but what if God doesn't show up? He never not shows up. If you go down low, he will always fill you. As sure as the sun rises every single day, if you go down low, he will resurrect you. You don't ever have to worry about God resurrecting you if you die. Die and he will, he will lift you up. On a side note, does anybody love to see the sunrise in the morning? Let me see, let me see your, your hands if you love to see the sunrise. Do you know why you love that? I'll tell you why you love that. The scripture says that the sun rising in the morning is like the bridegroom coming out of his chamber. God's calling you to be with him. That pull of beauty that you see, that's God saying, come be with me. Yeah, now try to miss the sunrise after that. <laughs> it plagues me in the morning when I think of the sun coming up. I don't want to miss the bridegroom coming out of his chamber. I've got to see him come out. So let us flee to... Jesus, and hide ourselves in him, that we may be clothed with humility. A twisted crown of thorns, too small in size, was pressed into his brow and blood flowed in his eyes, blinding him to all but the prize. This is humility personified, the blood of God not realized. His back lashed open both deep and wide with whips made up of sin and pride. And though men love things that are deified, not a God who's crucified, but that's not God. He comes and he dies. Oh, precious blood of him who loved me so. His hands are nailed and his head hangs low. His body is broken. His back is lashed open. The splinter cross is soaked in blood. Oh, what love, a love of me. And I see thy glory when thy feet upon the sea. But never such glory as when they're fastened to the tree. The breath of life breathes out his ghost, a dismayed angelic host with a naked God upon the post. He's mostly red. Come down, they said. Man's faith is dead, but God bled for sin to bring you back in. I'm telling you right now, God is calling each one of you to freshly come to the foot of the cross and say, I'm going down low so that I can be raised up again in newness of life and walk with the power of his grace in my life every single day.